Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today we'll be looking at using magic squares as a means of generating compositional material. Magic squares is a useful compositional technique for those of you who maybe have writer's block or want to explore something different in your music that you might not otherwise do. We'll be looking in particular at magic squares and Peter Maxwell Davies' Ave Maris Stella because he uses magic squares in this piece of music. So without further ado, grab a cup of tea or a coffee and let's begin. Like I said, today we'll be looking at using magic squares as a means for generating compositional material. Peter Maxwell Davis, famous composer, he has been using magic squares as part of his compositional techniques consistently for years. Or he had been using them consistently for years. Yes. Basically, he uses it to produce material. Material whatever that is, that he can then sculpt and craft into musical substance. Again, whatever that is. Just a bit of context about Peter Maxwell Davis. In 2004, he was made master of the Queen's music and stayed in this job for 10 years. He was replaced by Judith Weir in 2014 when his terms of office expired. piece we'll be looking at that uses the magic square technique is Peter Maxwell Davies's Avi Maristella. This piece is regarded by many to be his finest and most original work. You don't have to believe or agree with this of course. It was written in 1975, five years after Maxwell Davies moved to Orkney, if you're interested in that. According to Griffith's useful book on Maxwell Davies you should read. The piece involves a tightly wrought structure which focuses the music as real chamber music. Whatever that means. Unlike much of Maxwell Davies' work up to this time, there is no violent expressionism. No king singing of cabbages, for instance, as in his eight songs for a mad king, which is violently expressive. If you've heard of his eight songs for a mad king, it's... Um, quite well violently expressive is the only way I can explain it. There's a mad king singing about cabbages, someone smashes a violin. Look this piece up. Avi Maristella is allegedly based on plain song which praises Mary as star of the sea, hence the title Avi Maristella. It is however difficult to pinpoint the original plain chant in this piece. So there's a little bit of an enigma there for you. This piece feels a lot calmer than some of his more violent stuff. Well we get a long sustained argument rather than momentary flashes of musical violence. I recommend getting a score, listening to it um, and following the score. I mean as a starting point when you listen to it and follow the score, look at the marimba part and listen for the contrast between the marimba chordal textures and the other melodies. You take some of the notes to make up the chordal marimba harmonies from the melodies that surround it. The process underpinning all his music is the magic square. I have a copy of the magic square here. Can you figure out how it works just by looking at it? If you had to compose from this, what would you do? So, can you work out how it you Can you work out how it works? Let's have a look at the pitch first. So each row is a transposition of the preceding one. Look at the rows. Each row is a transposition of the preceding one. But he doesn't just repeat the row and transpose it, no. <laughs> Why would he do that? What he does is he shifts the pitches along as if these rows were on some kind of conveyor belt. That's the only way I can visualise it. And as he does this, he also transposes it. He shifts them along. It's not like just one goes down, one row goes down to the next row. It's like they sort of shift along one and move down. So they move down and then there's a shift. So and as he does this, he transposes it. For example, the second row is essentially the first row up a fifth, albeit shifted along one like a conveyor belt. So the last pitch D in this instance becomes the first pitch of the new row. That is A. I'll just let that sink in. So, compare the second row and the third row. What has the third row been transposed up by? Bear in mind things are shifted along. 
The answer is it's been transposed up a major second. The fourth row is transposed up a semitone and so on. Now the intervals he chooses to transpose each new row up by are intuitive. What I mean by that is it's just whatever he wants to do. Now let's look at the numbers. So the numbers refer to durations. So for instance if 1 equals a quaver, 2 would equal 2 times a quaver which is a crotchet, 3 would equal a dotted crotchet, 3 times a quaver and so on. Now as you can see Maxwell Davis square is 9 by 9 but when you do yours you can choose how big or small you want it. You could have a 5 by 5 square if you wanted. That's fine. Maxwell Davies has nine numbers. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. How does he arrange the numbers in the first row? Well, this is where he gets more processes involved. He adds 5 to each number. There's no real reason why it's 5, it just is. You'll notice eventually that he adds five across rows and down columns, but I'll focus on the rows for now. So starting with one, arbitrarily, we'll start with one. He adds five. This gives us, you got it, six. So this gives us six in the second square of the row. He then adds five again, as he does to each number, but this gives two. Look at the third square in the row. You'd expect it to be 11, right? Because 6 add 5 is 11. Well, remember, he's only distributing 5 to each number to distribute the 9 numbers. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. He's not going to create additional numbers that go above 9. So basically, when he gets to 9, he starts again at the beginning. 6 plus 5 equals 2. 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2. Basically, the row is modulus 9. Picture a clock face with 9 numbers instead of 12. When you get to 9, you start at the beginning again. So that's that. Now, how are the numbers distributed throughout the rest of the magic square then? Well, basically, he adds 5 onto each number. And like the initial row, the numbers can't go above 9. So C sharp 1 plus 5 gives a 6. Likewise, E sharp 6 plus 5 equals G sharp 11, but subtract 9 from 11 and you get G sharp 2, or just count 2 after 9, as if it were a clock face of 9 values, 9, 1, 2. And so on throughout the magic square. Okay, now that Maxwell Davis has his square and the basic material that he needs, how does he use it? This is where it gets really fun, actually. The square is treated as a journey board, a journey board. That is, the instruments read various paths through it. Just pick a path. It's really great if you've got a writer's block and you think, oh, I need a melody quick. Or just go through the magic square and see what happens. The most obvious example is the opening cello part line from the Andante introduction from bar one in the score. Here, the cello reads from left to right, top to bottom. Have a look. So let's look at the piano part. If we now look, if you have, right, get the score. Get the score, you need the score. Um, I will provide examples here if I can. Look at page three where the piano enters. Page three where the piano enters. What material is the pianist playing? Basically, the piano plays the square backwards. Have a look, have a look at this square. What do we notice about the register of these notes? More angular, right? And what is happening? Tempo, speed-wise. Well, the piano plays a square backwards, yes, but at four times the speed of the original cello line. One equals a quaver at the beginning, but one equals a demi-semi-quaver here. And also, Maxwell Davies is doing the square backwards from E9. The original cello line is just from the first row in the magic square. My point is, you can travel along this magic square however you want. You can alter the durations. A quaver could equal four times the speed of that. It could be a demi-semi-quaver or you could slow it down. A quaver could equal a crotchet and you could alter the rest of the row accordingly. 
Let's look at the viola part now. Have a look at the viola on page two. What is happening pitch-wise? Okay, it's the same as the piano. What is happening rhythmically? Well, <laughs> it's a three, five rhythmic proportion of the original square's durations. So basically, what I mean by that is, one now equals a quintuplet semiquaver instead of what it originally equaled, which would have been a quaver. It's a quintuplet semiquaver now. So remember what I said, if one equals a quaver, two has to be twice that, and so on. And he's altered the first duration here, so one now equals a quintuplet semiquaver, and two would have to equal two times that. Three would equal three times that, and so on. Bit more complex. But he's getting material that he probably wouldn't have come up with had he not used this method. Let's have a look at the alto flute part. Now, the alto flute part is less rigorous in its use of the magic square. The opening gesture on the first page of the score is from row 2. So that's G sharp, B sharp, G, B, F sharp, D sharp, E. Note that B sharp is written as C. It has much freer rhythms that do not relate to the magic square's durations. In this instance, Max of Darius has sort of not paid attention to the rhythms as much and focused on the pitch. So the first half of the alto flute's second gesture is a reading of row 4 on the magic square from the penultimate A in retrograde, so that's A, D, B flat, D sharp and B. So by now, you should be following the basic principle of this magic square. Maxwell Davis takes material from the magic square to make his music, that's all it is, and you can do it however you want, and he's doing it however he wants. Let's have a look at the marimba part now. This part is quite simple, and I think if you're going to do something like Maxwell Davis, write this part last. Basically, the marimba part just takes pitches from the surrounding instruments and creates some sort of chordal harmonic accompaniment that sort of fills in the gaps and makes the texture thicker and more sustained and harmonious. And again, I don't necessarily mean consonant. It can be harmonious in however you want it to be. So yes, the marimba is picking out certain notes of the cello part and crystallising them as a harmonic background, you could say. <laughs> well, you could also view it as taking the melodic horizontal melodies and transforming it into a more vertical chordal section. That happens simultaneously. If you look at the score, it would be quite clear to see this, actually. The marimba takes the fourth note of the cello, the E, uh, then the sixth note, G sharp, and the eighth. F sharp, and finally the D sharp most likely comes from the alto flute. Now, let's have a look at pitch centricities. What's a pitch centricity, you might ask? Well, it's basically a preponderance of a certain pitch. Kind of like a tonal centre, but not that, because this is not tonal. So, the magic square reveals certain pitch centricities. So, the C sharp to E sharp of row one could be likened to a tonic mediant relationship. This is something that Maxwell Davis later referred to in his large symphonic works. The equivalent C or B sharp to E could be an alternative tonic to mediant. Sorry, this is outlined in green here. So these pitch centricities accurately give the piece its consonant feel. If you have harmonic patterns in the magic square, you're most likely to end up with harmonic patterns in the music. So I might still say this is arguably thought about the harmonic relationships here. It's kind of like a species counterpoint where you don't just follow the rules but work with relationships between pitches too. If you look throughout this piece, um, you'll find pitch centricities arise throughout different tonal centres. Um, remember it's atonal, but you'll find different pitch centricities arise throughout the piece at various points. It's all subjective, I think. As long as you can argue your point, you're fine. Now, again, like I said, you can navigate this magic square however you want. So let's have a look what he does with the clarinet part. He gets a bit more adventurous in section two. In section two, the clarinet appears and it presents a new path through the square. This is diagonally from top left. I've annotated it here. What I recommend you do is look at the score, name the pitches in the clarinet part and then compare it to this magic square here. So, you can generate repeated rhythms if you want. 
that's something he does, he repeats rhythms. Although he's, he's varied it in this clarinet part. If you look at the top corner, you've got C sharp one, and you can go down to A6, and then across to E sharp six. So you're repeating a rhythm here, six and six. And if you go down to D sharp two, then it's up to G sharp two, then to B sharp two. So if you go diagonally across the square, you can see that that's how you can get rhythms to repeat one after the other. Because you've got a row, like a diagonal row of repeated rhythms. So around this central line, the flute and piano weave more complex decorative material, but it is still based on the square. Also, look at the piano part. The opening chord is derived from the first row, minus the B and B sharp. So you could generate chords with these two. Generate chords with the magic square. Basically, you can take material, material, from the magic square however you want. Melodies, durations, chords, repeated rhythms, and so on. You can probably work all this out if you just study the score and compare it with the magic square, though. Anyway. There are nine sections, and each section derives material from the magic square. Maxwell Davis derives this material from the magic square either linearly, diagonally, in a spiral, or as a mixture of various directions. There's a book by Paul Griffiths that outlines a general structure for the whole of Ave Mari Stella. Let's have a look at the symmetrical and canonic structure to Avi Maris Stella. Let's have a look at this outline of the structure here. This is my own outline. I do like tables. They help me understand things, I think. As you can see, there's some sort of mirror canon involved. Remember my lecture on uh, Messian's music? I do talk about mirror canons, but basically there's a mirror. Until you get to section 9, it kind of breaks this pattern. Don't know why he does that. Possibly to make a coda. He might be breaking the process just to suit his music and that's fine too. You can break a process if you think you've got a better idea uh, if something else suits the music. You know, don't be, don't be ruled by a pre-compositional process. You are after all a composer. And rules are meant to be broken. Also, I feel there's some sort of prolational, prolation canon. There's some sort of mirror canon aspect to the structure of his piece. Remember my last lecture on canons? I do talk about the mirror canon there. And in my lecture on Messian, I talk about palindromic patterns. It's basically these mirror patterns. Section 9 kind of deviates from this pattern. I don't know why he does that. Possibly to make a coda. Possibly to differentiate the final section from the rest. Possibly because he thought the music sounded better doing this overall. And that's fine. You can do that. You don't have to be governed by some pre-compositional material. You're a composer, you're meant to break the rules and write music that you feel is music because it all comes from you. You have the authority to make those decisions. These, at the end of the day, are just means of overcoming writer's block or composing something you wouldn't have done normally or just figuring out something new. Breaking those boundaries of preconceived knowledge about how music should be and going beyond yourself. I also feel there's some aspect to you can disagree with me here, this is my idea. I feel like there's some influence to the Prolation Canon in its structure. Again, if you want a refresher in the Prolation Canon, the Prolation Canon, oh my god. Again, if you want some reminder about the Prolation Canon, check out my Canon lecture. Why do I think there's a Prolation Canon involved in the structure? Well, because the small scale is inextricably linked with the large scale. In that, there are nine notes in the square, and nine sections in the piece. So remember a prolation canon. You have the first subject and then you might have other subjects, sorry, and then you might have other parts copying that subject, imitating it in canon, simultaneously but maybe augmented overall larger. So you have smaller melodies sort of fitting, shorter melodies fitting into the same melody which has been elongated. Likewise you have this big structure of nine sections encompassing all these mini little nine rows, uh, nine pitches, nine rhythms that have been explored in the magic square and so on. There seems to be a pattern of nine macro level sections with nine micro level patterns and there's nines involved throughout the whole thing that have been augmented and diminished in I guess in parameters, yeah. Have a think about it, it requires just, just dwell on that for a minute. 
You don't need to hear any more of my musings. Let's conclude. What is the main point of this lecture you should take away with you? Well, it is important to differentiate between pre-composition and composition in your own work. So the magic square is pre-composition, as indeed are the directions in which Maxwell Davis moves around the square, diagonally, backwards, and so on. The composition aspect is how he is assigning it to instruments, how he deviates from that pre-compositional process, how he makes decisions as a composer to break those predefined rules and do something to serve the music in his opinion. Composition is where he decides which instruments to assign various melodies to, for example as a melody in the cello or as a chordal tremolando build up in the marimba, as a rhythmically free quasi descant in the alto flute, as well as the various ways in which rhythms are assigned. So he'll have one as a quaver at the start but then he'll change it to a triplet quaver later in the piece and a quintuplet semi quaver later on and so on. So it's how you take the material put it into the music and then compose with it. Differentiate between pre-composition and composition. The composition is how this pre-compositional material is assigned to various instruments and structured throughout a piece of music. Create your own magic square, not necessarily 9x9, nine nine. you can, you don't have to, it can be anything by anything. 5x5, five 12x12. Five. 12 12. Write a small sketch in which you derive music from the magic square. Be creative in your approach. Don't simply transcribe music from the magic square into the score. Although you can do this as well as other approaches. Use what Maxwell Davis does um, in Avi Mari's Stella as a guide. Don't merely copy it. Add your own approach to write music that you want to write. Bye!